Yeah, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Alessandra Yelpi, uh, assistant professor at uh, Laurentian University in Sudbury, uh, Canada. Alessandra is originally from Italy, and he, uh, he got his PhD in the University of Siena working on uh, tectonically active and uh, phonerozoic and recent basins. And uh, at that time, he already developed interest in impact of vegetation on, on uh, fluvial systems. And uh, he came for a visit to Dalhousie, I think in 2013, and must have liked uh, Canada uh, so much. And but he realized that uh, Europe is too small for him. And he followed up with a postdoctoral uh, position in Geological Survey of Canada with Rob Rainbird. Uh, when he worked on paleoproterozoic sedimentary succession in Arctic Canada and eventually got a position at Laurentian University. And he will address today a question that uh, we kind of all learn in uh, um, introductory sediment sedimentary geology classes that we, um, absence of vegetation in Precambrian should have impact on um, fluvial systems, but uh, it's probably one of the first studies where it was addressed in a more uh, profound way. So take it from here, Alexandra. Thank you very much, Andrew and Alex for the uh, introductory words. And uh, so yes, I'm talking today from Sudbury, Ontario. So first I would like to acknowledge that our campus is located on the traditional lands of the Tikamakshin, Nashnabek, and Wenapiti First Nation. So thanks for students, indigenous students and elders on, on campus for their stewardship. And uh, I also would like to uh, uh, make a few acknowledgements before I start. Uh, first of all, I'm very happy to see that there's uh, quite a few friends uh, online today. Uh, the list of acknowledgements would be very long, but uh, in, in particular, I have to pay my respect to uh, my supervisors, Gino in Padua for my PhD, and Martin at Dalhousie, and of course, Rob at the Geological Survey of Canada. And also uh, make a note that uh, the uh, material that I'm presenting today, specifically the second part of the talk, is something that was uh, developed in close collaboration with uh, Mathieu Lapotre, who's uh, currently at uh, Stanford University and was doing a, P a postdoc at Harvard. When, uh, when we started working together. So I, I don't see many uh, geomorphologists in the audience today. There's a few sedimentologists, but uh, perhaps not many of you would actually define yourselves as proper geomorphologists. So the, the key question would be, uh, why would you care, right? Why would you care about a talk that in a ring of Precambrian geologists brings geomorphology in? Uh, I think that the answer to this is really the analysis of the sediment flux, right? Sediment flux, we know it's one of the three fundamental components of the rock cycle. It, it, it's also, as far as we know, what makes Hurt unique in the solar system. And uh, rivers and, and river geomorphology really is the key to understand the sediment flux, right? So in modern Earth, Rivers deliver about 16 petagrams of sediment per year, which is the largest uh, sediment flux by volume on Earth. And if we look at this beautiful diagram by Metivier et al, for example, the links between uh, uh, river science and geomorphology and uh, life sciences and solid earth sciences is obvious, right? In, in this uh, diagram, we see the unroofing of the Himalaya Karakoram operated by strong monsoonal precipitation that erodes uh, large uh, amounts of sediment that are directly rooted uh, by the Ganges in this, uh, by the Ganges and uh, Indus and Brahmaputra towards the Indus and Bengal fence, right? Which are, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, among the largest individual sediment bodies on earth, if not the largest. And what is perhaps most important, at least to us today, is that the sediment flux modulates also uh, biogeochemical cycling on Earth, right? And, and I will expand upon this later, but in, in this very schematic and very uh, um, coarse representation of the carbon cycle, uh, 
we can actually zoom in the continental component uh, of it and realize how many processes are either uh, modulated by uh, fluvial processes or atmospheric processes that are linked in turn to fluvial processes or by life itself, right? Um, and the rock record provides evidence that at times there have been changes in surface processes that were dramatic enough to alter at least the intensity, if not the budget of, of uh, uh, some key components of uh, biogeochemical cycling, such as silicate weathering or photosynthesis. And a topical example, as, as Andrew introduced, and one that really guided the early part of my research was that of the uh, polyzoic greening of the continents. So the col colonization of, uh, of continents by plants has received a lot of attention in the past. It certainly revolutionized the way that, um, that sediment is matured and transported on land. And uh, uh, plants evolved in a snapshot if, if we look at it geologically, right? In, in about 150 million years or perhaps less, we went from uh, a relatively barren uh, earth where only microbial surfaces, uh, microbial mats could colonize sedimentary surfaces to uh, vegetation that was not the vegetation of today, but that at least had the life strategies that we observe today in the full spectrum of, of landscapes, right? And, and it's incredibly relevant uh, by geochemically, right? Like if we look at uh, vegetation today, we have about 650 petagrams of organic carbon just in living biomass. Soils store at least 2,300 uh, petagrams. Some say that this is a coarse underestimation. And of course, plants have a way to modulate silicate weathering, uh, the patterns of organic carbon oxidation on land and the sediment storage. However, I want to make the point that most of the research, including mine in the past, is largely foc focused on mechanical aspects, right? How, how sedimentation can be um, slowed down by plants buff buffling um, uh, flood waves uh, or how roots can uh, strengthen channel banks, right? Uh, as in this cartoon that, uh, that is derived from one study of mine on the Joggins formation. Um, a leading hypothesis, this is the leading hypothesis that I would like to explore today with you uh, that has received, uh, at least in the past, not much attention is that vegetation alters sediment fluxes and thus the biogeochemical cycles in a fashion that render earth even more hospitable to life, right? So that that the processes are actually linked by a positive feedback loop. loop. And um, what I'm going to demonstrate today is that there is a lot to explore and that the colonization of land masses may actually have altered uh, in, in a dramatic fashion, not just the sedimentary record, but global carbon transport, storage, and burial. And this, of course, is key to understanding the Precambrian record because we have, in a way or another, to uh, address how the colonization of land plants uh, changed the uh, surface processes and therefore how surface processes worked in the Precambrian before macroscopic life. So I'm just going to go uh, ahead with a just two minute crash course on, on river functioning just to make sure that we speak you know all the same language. If we look at a fluvial landscape today we can divide it in two domains, channels and floodplains, with channels transporting water and sediment whenever discharge is present. Uh, and they can be, channels can be characterized based on their discharge regime. Like, are they perennial or are they flooding uh, ephemerally uh, based on their geometry? Are they narrow or are they relatively wide in terms of their geometry also in plant form? So how many channels? Is that a single thread or a multi-thread? Are they sinuous or are they straight? Um, and uh, also particularly important in terms of their mobility. Are they migrating laterally? Are they aggrading vertically or are they incising, right? And then we have the floodplains that instead are only active during uh, overspill. So when the channel cannot take all the discharge. Um, they host uh, soils, they host uh, the majority of plant biomass in a fluvial landscape, and therefore they can be treated as transient 
storage sites for not just sediment, but also organic carbon. Um, sedimentologists really like channels and uh, because they are architecturally and sedimentologically varied and they tend to uh, give less weight to floodplains because they are architecturally and sedimentologically more monotonous and therefore sedimentologists, at least some tend to think that floodplains are sort of boring, which is a shame because as I said, they are enormous midterm reservoirs of sediment and carbon. And really how sediment carbon is stored and floodplain processes is really what bridges processes at human and geological time scales. Here, here's an example from the Yukon River. Please don't mind the, um, the north arrow that is crooked so that the images could fit. We have topography, floodplain lows, and uh, amount of uh, organic carbon stored in soil per surface. Uh, it's one of the largest watersheds in North America and uh, about half of its catchment is underlain by floodplains that are actively receiving sedimentation. So um, the, the, the Yukon River watershed in itself stores 15 petagrams of organic carbon. These are substantial numbers. If we would oxidize all of this organic carbon at once, the atmospheric budget of CO2 would be significantly altered. So we have to understand really how channel processes alter and control the patterns of sediment storage in a floodplain. And if you wish, we can simplify what a channel can do in terms of morphodynamic processes in, in three key processes, uh, migration, cutoff, and avulsion. Migration is simply when the channel shifts its position laterally, and it's something that is determined by concurrent deposition on an inner bank and erosion on an outer bank. It just depends on the flow structure of the channel itself. Cutoff itself, uh, cutoff also is relatively easy to understand simply when we have two bands that are actively migrating and intersect each other, and they uh, simply isolate a portion of the river band that has become too sinuous. And then we have avulsion, and uh, it can be described as a sudden change of river course. It's typically caused by channel filling, whereby the channel itself raises uh, its bottom against the distal floodplain to a point where it becomes unstable from a, from a gravitational potential point of view, such that such a, the, the river course is forced to diverge such that it can follow a path of least resistance, right? Um, if we look at beautiful uh, time-lapse imagery that is now available thanks to the Landsat program for some rivers on Earth, here's an example from the Upper Ukayali River, which is in the uh, upper, uh, in the upper um, Amazon uh, watershed. We can see that uh, cutoff, avulsion, migration really are processes that take place at human timescales, right? In this time-lapse here we have about 32 years represented. So at this point, we can move on and, and state or hypothesize that the fluvial rec record allows us to test whether and how the colonization of land masses by plants alter surface processes significantly. And we can test this hypothesis in multiple ways, right? We, some rely on direct comparisons of pre-vegetation, including Precambrian and, and post-vegetation or actually, since I see that uh, uh, Will McMahon is in the audience, seen vegetation uh, systems, including modern sediments, and other instead cannot be tested directly using rock record, and, and that's where geomorphological data sets uh, come in, right? So let's start with uh, the simplest, channel geometry. How do we characterize the channel? The channel can be characterized in, in modern terms as a form, Okay, so it's a depression that hosts uh, active flow and, and uh, transport of sediment, or geologically as a, a body of sediment that has its own width, its own depth, and uh, with certain uh, sedimentological characters, right? Um, the, um, the inference of channel geometry in the rock record is relatively simple. We, all we need is a full outcrop exposure. 
or you know extremely compelling well core data sets uh, and and likewise despite um, compaction being uh, an open problem we can also find a way to at least estimate coarsely the uh, the original thickness or depth of the flow based on the thickness of the sediment body looking at the sedimentology of the deposits that are filling a channel we can establish uh, based on sedimentary structures whether the flow was generically speaking for the most part tranquil or, or fast flowing and this is based on on key principles in sedimentology such as the, the fruit equation and i will talk about this uh, more in a couple of slides so the first test really uh, can uh, deal with uh, um, channel geometry right and for for a long time span um, it was thought that precambrian rivers in the absence of vegetation stabilizing their banks would have attained relatively shallow and wider geometry than than uh, vegetated rivers and this hypothesis uh, is something that we tested with uh, rob Rainbird and gino and other colleagues of mine during my postdoc and we actually arrived at the conclusion that uh, we cannot disentangle a clear distinction in geometry between Precambrian and, uh, and Phanerozoic, including modern channels, right? So here we have in a log log plotted um, um, in a space of uh, thickness or depth uh, expressed as a function of width. We have modern unvegetated, uh, uh, Phanerozoic uh, vegetated, and a number of data points from Precambrian channels, including um, um, rock units of Polyproterozoic vintage in, uh, in the Arctic Canadian Shield, um, uh, Meso to Neoproterozoic rocks in Scotland and Neoproterozoic rocks again in the Canadian Shield. So, uh, and also these are deposits that cover a relatively broad range of watershed size and and uh, and scale, as you can see, based on reconstructed provenance patterns. So, really, at least based on this data set, we can't really establish a clear distinction in geometry between uh, um, uh, pre-vegetation and seam vegetation channels. Um, discharge regime and uh, um, infer from sedimentary structures is another way to really investigate potential differences. And this is, uh, again, where the, uh, the uh, fruit equation that is expressed as the ratio between the velocity of the flow and the square root of gravity acceleration per flow depth, at times flow depth, comes handy. Um, Fielding et al. here, Publishes, has published this nice diagram that shows the, um, the hydrograph plots of two rivers with an example from the OB, classic perennial river. And you can see that the peaks are really predictable. They uh, occur at precise intervals and even at the lowest flow, there is a baseline discharge. And then the Burdekin River, uh, which uh, Chris Fielding really loves, uh, showing um, peak floods that are way less predictable in magnitude, in occurrence, and they are interposed with uh, times where there is essentially no active discharge in the channel. The good thing is that um, uh, based on key sedimentological principles, we can infer what kind of sedimentary record these two types of uh, discharge regimes are leaving behind. And by extrapolation, by looking at sedimentary records of Precambrian vint vintage, we can assess whether they were prevalently uh, ephemeral or, or else. So some of these uh, sedimentological um, uh, indicators rely, for example, on the abundance of cross beds versus um, supercritical flow regime structures such as plane beds and antidunes, but also channel geometry, right? With uh, perennial systems more often generating uh, thick channel bodies with uh, nice sigmoidal accretion surfaces and ephemeral systems generating instead relatively thin uh, channel bodies with uh, uh, planar geometry, right? So um, another uh, long-standing um, and, and yet untested hypothesis about prevegetation fluvial strata 
was that they they would have shared a flashy ephemeral discharge regime in the absence of plants buffering runoff, both in the watershed and uh, in, um, in, in the depositional systems. Um, if one reads uh, the, the, the compilation of literature by, by Daryl, for example, in, in 2011, one actually realizes that, that chances are a spectrum of uh, of discharge regimes were actually represented. And to explore further this hypothesis, uh, we compiled um, 98 prevegetation rock units that are representative of virtually all non proterozoic cratons, okay, with uh, time spans uh, in the record uh, reported on this side of the plot. And uh, uh, all the rock units were divided based on whether their sedimentology pointed to perennial, intermediate, or ephemeral discharge. And the compilation shows that despite their significant age uncertainties on some of the rock units, uh, the three main types of discharge regimes are represented at any given time and in most cratons and their coexistence. In other words, it disproves that, that pre-vegetation discharge regime would have been exclusively ephemeral. Um, when it comes to fluvial plant form, this is another fundamental test. This is where things get really complicated and, and, and that's where the debate in, uh, among Precambrian sedimentologists is not really settled because um, fluvial plant form and specifically whether a, a channel can attain sinuosity or not in the absence of bank strengthening vegetation is quite complicated. It, it's something that to assess on outcrop requires really time consuming and detailed approaches um, and um, it, inferences of past river plant form are really only possible when we have really good data on geometric uh, uh, relationship between uh, uh, strata and with polyflow indicators that can be collected in three dimensions with, with one example here from the, uh, uh, again, the Nelson Head Formation in the Northwest Territories. So there are multiple uh, facets to this approach and, and this would be its own talk. So sadly today I cannot go into the level of detail. So I'm, I'm just gonna simply step back and, and point out to some key concepts. So uh, if we look at a really mature river on earth, like something that flows for thousands of kilometers, like, like the Yukon River, uh, we typically observe a continuum of plant form configurations and, and geomorphologists like to, uh, they're kind of at odds with continuum. So we try to break that down in, in four classic types, right? So um, if, um, if we would, want to establish um, uh, a parallel with age uh, braided rivers in the upland most uh, portions of a watershed would be the teenagers, wandering and meandering reaches would be uh, adults, and anastomosing rivers would be the elders of, of river types, right? So in, in other words, uh, throughout their downstream evolution, rivers changed in sinuosity, bed slope, uh, sediment grade, but what is most relevant in the context of, of this talk is to, um, is to understand that um, braided rivers in higher slope uh, settings have stream power that typically exceeds uh, bank strength, whereas the opposite is true for lowland reaches that have very slow gradient, uh, very low gradient, uh, low stream power, and, and which is relatively speaking, uh, less important than bank strength. And this is really where vegetation becomes important, right? Because um, channels with uh, uh, easily erodible banks therefore will preferably attain braided plant form with floods breaching uh, through channel banks. Whereas um, when plant roots can stabilize channel banks and through other processes like chemical weathering and associated production of, of pedogenic clays that provide cohesion can alter the, uh, the plant form of a river, right? So in, in other words, just to summarize all of this, uh, all of this uh, departure is that in other words, vegetation has a way to alter the balance between stream power and bank strength and that insurance can alter that fluvial plant form. So 
with with this uh, consideration in mind, the status quo has been for quite some time that the rise of land plants throughout the Proterozoic strongly controlled the evolution of global fluvial style, and specifically <coughs> uh, has controlled uh, a sharp rise in uh, meandering rivers uh, right about at the boundary between the Silurian and Devonian. And uh, a, a conjecture that is associated with this uh, hypothesis excuse me, <clears throat> is that um, in pre-vegetation time, including the Precambrian, braided rivers would have been uh, uh, the dominant uh, plan for configuration. So um, I, um, I initially adhered to this conjecture, uh, later sort of like departed from it, having witnessed myself evidence of uh, uh, meandering rivers in pre-vegetation times. And uh, at, at, at the end of the day, I think that is really uh, about understanding how do we uh, recognize meandering rivers or for that matter, any plant form in, uh, in the rock record, right? So um, to do this, really, we have to find good modern analogs. So we have to find good sites where uh, a certain plant form is developed with or without land plants. And this brings me to the second part of the talk, which is uh, essentially entirely focused on modern systems and specifically on a type of rivers that uh, has been there for, for quite some time, but because satellite imagery was not really good in resolving remote areas, it was a type of river that was not really um, given much attention by geomorphologists and sedimentologists. And specifically, I'm referring to uh, rivers that are either somewhat sinuous or fully meandering and yet have no vegetation whatsoever in their alluvial plains. Uh, they are rare and they are uh, relatively restricted in, in, in terms of size. So they're, they're fed by relatively small watersheds. So they won't have the size of the Indus of the Ganges of, or the Mississippi, but nonetheless, they are there and they demonstrate that meandering can, in principle, be uh, uh, stable even without vegetation. Some examples are uh, beautifully exposed in the Great Basin. So all of you who are in California, I encourage you to go check, for example, the Amargosa River in Death Valley or the Terminal uh, Mojave River at uh, Zizex, also known as Soda Lake. This is really close to uh, this is in Southern California. Uh, other examples in uh, Central Nevada, the absolutely beautiful McLeod Springs Wash in, in Toyabe Basin, or nearby the Gab Springs Wash in, uh, in Columbus Basin and so forth. So there, there are examples right there. So to, to summarize the first part of the talk, we have a way to use rock records and test whether channel geometry, discharge regime, river plan form was or not invariant. But then there's this further aspect, very important for uh, understanding sediment fluxes and biogeochemical processes on land, there is river mobility that cannot be um, tested using rock record evidence. And we need an entirely different approach. An approach that is exquisitely geomorphological and specifically that relies on time-lapse analysis of channel migration in modern systems that either have very much vegetation in their floodplains or they are or that they are completely barren. So in, in this study with Mathieu, um, we identified about 980 individual meanders. Uh, most of them are contained in systems in the Great Basin and then there's other clusters in uh, in the Altiplano Pina Plateau of South America and in the the Iranian plateau of, of Iran. Um, <clears throat> and as you can see, there are systems, they are mm, confined to uh, arid climate zones. And we also included, just for comparison, a number of rivers in all climate belts except polar, for obvious reasons. Um, so the Yukon, Mackenzie, Apalachicola, and Oklachone in North America, the Caucasus. Purus, Solimoes, Pawini, and, and Parana in Central and South America, the Niger, Likoala, 
Okavango in Africa, and the uh, Vals, Uda, and Sembakung in Strickland in, in Eurasia and Oceania. How do we, uh, how do we <clears throat> compare apple and oranges? How do we compare the migration of vegetated and unvegetated rivers? Well, we have luckily uh, really good GIS uh, techniques at hand that, uh, and by good, I mean uh, stuff that can be really uh, learned by anybody in, in a few minutes. This is an example, it's called dynamic time warping. But regardless, you can do uh, direct analysis on screen or you can uh, em employ script-based algorithms. But regardless, what you are uh, uh, given with is a data set of migration rates. So simply how uh, the ratio between a distance migrated by a channel bank over a certain time. But perhaps most important, because we are looking at things over a range of scale, we immediately are faced with the problem of normalization, right? So the migration time scale is really a, a much more powerful metric in that is the amount of years that a channel takes to migrate its own width, okay? This way, really, we can compare a stream that is two meters in width with the Yukon or the Mackenzie, right? And, and as I showed, of course, these this rivers in the compilation have severely and drastically different scales. We're going from 10 to the power of zero to 10 to the power of three, okay? Few meters to few kilometers in, uh, in channel width. And uh, uh, applying this, um, this analysis, we have uh, this uh, scatter that is representative of unvegetated rivers and this scatter here that is representative of strongly vegetated rivers. The first things that uh, comes to the eye is that yes, indeed, migration rate scales positively and sublinearly with channel width. In other words, larger channels migrate faster, smaller channels migrate slower, and that's good. Um, what I found absolutely fascinating about this analysis is that uh, once we fit a power law through these two data sets, the power law has the same exponent for both data sets, right? We, it's, a, it's a sublinear fit. The exponent is about six over seven, so 0 0.85. And uh, the, the fact that vegetated and unvegetated channels really respond to a power law that has the same exponent tells me something, tells me that there is a component of migration that is just inherent uh, with channel width, but then of course there has to be a component that is inherent with uh, bank strength. And what in the equation here in, in this uh, power law best fits uh, encapsulate bank strength is the prefactor of the power law, right? Or in other words, the intersection of, of this line with the ordinates. And, and we can see that there is <clears throat> roughly an order of magnitude in separation between these prefactors. In other words, that brought it like in simple words, if you take a channel of a certain width, if it has a lot of vegetation along it, its banks, it will migrate about an order of magnitude slower, okay? Um, we ran some, some tests making sure that uh, sinuosity or watershed size or uh, relief, all these other physiographic metrics were not actually confounding our data set. So there is no other way to disentangle uh, migration rate uh, than, uh, um, than the presence of vegetation. And this is <clears throat> when I wanna go back to uh, our floodplains and specifically the importance of midterm carbon storage in the floodplains. Because of course, <clears throat> as, a as a channel bank, be it meandering or not migrates, it disturbs uh, the soils on the outer bank, it remobilizes the sediment that was deposited in the floodplain on the outer bank and therefore mobilizes the terrestrial carbon uh, that was stored therein, uh, possibly making it subject to either oxidation or perhaps oceanward delivery, right? The oceanward transport. So we have to look briefly <clears throat> at how the organic carbon is present in a, in a fluvial system. So broadly speaking, the total organic carbon can be 
separated in dissolved component and a particulate component the dissolved just is dissolved and is promptly passed to a sink or the ocean, whereas the particulate component behaves as granular sediment, essentially, right? And in turn, the particulate organic carbon can be subdivided in a biospheric component, which is the recent biomass, so uh, carbon that was fixated through photosynthesis in the watershed, okay? Maybe it's a few thousand years old, but anyway, it's not geologically old. And then we have the petrogenic component that is actually very, very, very old organic carbon that was uh, photosynthesized in a remote geological past, was deposited in sediments that then have been uh, <clears throat> exhumed and eroded in the catchment. And, and this organic carbon, typically in the form of, you know, a complex uh, stuff like kerogen, structurally complex, I mean, uh, <clears throat> is rooted again uh, down the watershed. Why do we operate this difference? Because um, the biospheric is typically C14 live and the petrogenic is typically 14, uh, C14 dead, right? It has an age that is much, much, much older than the half time of, of C14. In other words, we have a way, at least in modern rivers, to use isotope geochemistry to test the fractionation between uh, different type of organic carbon. Regardless of the type, if we have POC accumulation in soils that acts as a, as a sink for CO2 from the atmosphere, if we have soil reworking due to, again, for example, river migration that may expose particulate organic carbon to oxidation and therefore it would act as a CO2 source. And soil erosion, also interesting, uh, it's something that may locally boost silicate weathering, so at least locally at the watershed scale may also act as a CO2 sink. So <clears throat> these predictive models can be tested using uh, isotope geochemistry, specifically a combination of, of, of uh, uh, C14 to C12, but also stable isotope geochemistry, because we'll see these two have different uh, delta C13 uh, signatures. What is really important is that we need to formulate um, a relationship that allows us to understand how the soil residence time scale, so how long sediment resides in a floodplain together with its little fraction of organic carbon in relation to migration and specifically in, regression to, in relation to this migration time scale. And, and this is where things get a little complicated because it's easier said than done. We know or we can measure how fast a channel migrates, but statistically and stochastically speaking, to understand where that channel is going to migrate is much, much more complicated, right? And, and it depends, of course, on the physiographic setting of the river and specifically whether, for example, is confined in a valley, such as in this example from the Willamette River in, in Washington State, or if it's unconfined, such as this uh, example from the Porcupine River in Alaska. So a particle of soil that is located here, far away from the active channel, will have a much, much lesser chance of being reworked than a soil here that is in a valley confined meandering river. Like here, we know that the channel sooner or later, actually sooner, is going to rework that soil. But in unconfined settings, is is more complicated, right? So, but to cite my uh, favorite philosopher, Carl Jung, like in all chaos, there is a cosmos and in all disorder, a secret order. And to understand the secret order, we can overcome limitations if we employ numerical modeling. And this actually gives great insight. Uh, numerical modeling, meaning uh, numerical simulations that take into consideration the physical laws of flow structure in a river and bank strength along uh, along the floodplain. And the results of uh, one such numerical models have been published about four years ago by Mark Torres at Rice University. It's an experiment or a set of experiment that I particularly like because they were uh, first able to um, identify a dimensionless uh, um, residence time scale that is the ratio between the, what we want to find, so the sediment uh, the residence timescale proper, divided by the typical timescale over which a meander in their simulation undergoes cutoff. And in turn, 
through the same experiments, they were also able to relate this cutoff time scale to the migration time scale times an empirical coefficient. So in other words, we can rearrange things and we can solve for, for the proper soil residence time scale, which essentially is the migration time scale times two empirical coefficients, right? Um, in this plot, um, the probability of a given dimensionless residence time scale is, uh, is uh, reported as the average for multiple experiments. And you can see that um, the fitting of a curve here is kind of complicated. So here, for just for, uh, for uh, simplicity, I'm reporting in red with a dashed line an exponential uh, fit, but be aware that the authors actually uh, used a somewhat more complicated fit, a tempered Pareto function. But anyway, there is a way to probabilistically express a residence time scale based on numerical models. At this point, you can ask yourself, how long is particulate organic carbon going to reside in a floodplain? And this is indeed controlled by lateral migration, as I explained, but also by the vertical aggradation of the channel. So how fast a river deposits sediment and builds its own alluvial plain in the upward direction. So, um, since we know that channel evolution takes place when the channel has aggraded about a full depth uh, um, above the distal flight plane, we can also express an evolution time scale, which is simply the ratio between the channel depth and the aggradation rate. And uh, this is another um, this is another uh, approach that now allows to compare apples and oranges. Right? We can now compare uh, migration and aggradation or avulsion simply because both are expressed temporally as characteristic time scales. And specifically, we can have these two end member scenarios where we have slow aggradation and fast migration where the avulsion time scale is much higher than the migration time scale and the opposite, uh, uh, fast migration and, and slow migration. Sorry, uh, fast aggradation and slow migration. Um, luckily, we can use some data points and reference points from, uh, from modern systems. Um, aggradation timescales and, and aggradation rates can be derived by looking at chronologically calibrated cores, for example, in, uh, in modern basins. That, of course, comes with the understanding that subsidence and aggradation rates throughout a basin are severely variable with space, right? You would not expect subsidence and aggradation to be linearly distributed in a structurally complex basin where subsidence is controlled by, uh, by differential fault off throw. Regardless, we can see that over a certain range of, of time scales, um, um, aggradation is sublinear with time and in and the the Earth's crust really is well understood how it behaves, such that in most modern active depositional basins, uh, we have a range of aggradation rates that go in between 10 to the power of minus one to 10 millimeters a year, right? So using this very broad um, uh, uh, constraints and using the data that we have for migration rates from modern vegetated and unvegetated rivers, we can say that generally speaking, generally speaking, avulsion timescales can range in between a century and a few tens of thousand years, whereas migration timescales range from few years to few decades for unvegetated rivers and few decades to few centuries for vegetated rivers. So at this point, we're, we're uh, finding ourselves with two scenarios. Is um, avulsion faster than migration? That's theoretically possible. It's, some, it's something that you see in, in fast aggrading and very slow migrating rivers. And in that case, we have a fraction of particulate organic carbon that is indefinitely preserved from channel migration. In other words, it enters again, the, uh, or for the first time, the sedimentary record. In the opposite scenario, which looking at the timescales that I've shown in the previous slide are the preferred ones, we have a way to express the soil resonance timescale as a function of uh, the uh, migration timescale. And in that case, we have 
a scenario where the uh, vegetation, well, the, the uh, rise of vegetation on Earth would have impacted a tenfold uh, slowdown, not just in migration, but also uh, a tenfold increase in, uh, in soil, soil resonance timescale. So in other words, I, I'm wanting to stress upon the importance of this conclusion. We have to understand that soil maturation and, and so pedogenesis and vegetation uh, uh, density are two aspects of biogeomorphology that are really intimately connected and, uh, and vegetation, migration, floodplain stability and soil maturity therefore are linked all together by positive feedback loops. And we can go back to our schematic representation of the carbon cycle again with a focus on on terrestrial processes and really start to you know play with our mind and understand how many aspects of biogeochemical cycling must have been different on land not different in terms of uh, of uh, the proper reactions but difference in terms of incidence rates in the precambrian world that had no microscopic vegetation stabilizing channel banks right so I, I, can, uh, <clears throat> I can bring this to conclusion uh, with just a few words uh, with, you know, uniformitarianism is a key assumption for the study of Precambrian uh, landscapes, especially when looking at aspects such as channel geometry, discharge regime, possibly even plan form. But there are other aspects that cannot really be studied unless we really focus on not sedimentary records, but the behavior of modern systems. And in, in that specific regard, modern desert meandering streams can disclose aspects of pre-ordovician surface processes that were otherwise very uh, hard to uh, disentangle. And the results hopefully allow for tighter link between sedimentology, but also by geochemistry and, and solid earth disciplines. And uh, of course, there is a way to uh, coarsely scale for um, for different gravity on uh, different planets. And if we do that, potentially we can even apply this uh, equation to other realms and understand how uh, river migration may have acted on extraterrestrial surfaces such as that of Mars. That's all I have for today. Uh, thanks very much for uh, listening and I'm very happy to take questions. Great. Well, thank you very much, Alessandra. Um, yes, we'll transition into the question and discussion portion. Um, often just takes a minute for people to get their thoughts together. Yeah, maybe I can start as we wait uh, for hours. Um, so interesting talk, uh, just one comment uh, uh, where increase in oxygen in Precambrian also can have effect on remineralization of organic matter on floodplain. And mm -hmm. in that sense, it's really interesting that uh, with low atmospheric oxygen, you will have higher potential for preservation of organic matter on floodplain. But as uh, plants would appear, uh, oxygen level would go up. And so you have two opposite uh, feedbacks. Uh, one feedback that more oxygen fast oxidize organic carbon on flat plane. On the other hand, plants would stabilize uh, flat plane and would help to preserve organic matter. So in a way, uh, these two feedbacks might at least partially compensate the Counteract. That's very interesting. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, the rate of organic carbon oxidation depends on how much oxygen you have in the atmosphere. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's That could be uh, investigated in an upcoming study and see which one of these two uh, counteracting processes prevails. Daryl? Yeah, um, in your uh, uh, hyper-arid basin systems where you show this lovely, lovely meandering systems, particularly in, in the Mohave River, 
Um, is it possible that the meanders are inherited from the foul leg of a primary braided system? Because you see on the sides of some of those more distal ones, what appears to be little secondary channels. I'm mm -hmm. wondering what, what, what happens is that during uh, subsequent, when you for, first form the stream, stream, you start with a braided stream, and then you reoccupy the foul leg sufficient number of times that it becomes a meandering system. Um, so that in principle, it can be the case, right? Um, I mean, channel platform really is dictated by the, the, the balance between stream power, sediment grade, slope, and, and, and bank strength, right? So if I, I'm okay with imaging a system that starts as braided and then boundary conditions change and becomes meandering, that, that is still a valid case study for me. In the uh, specific of the Mojave River, um, we can exclude that, I think, relatively fairly be, uh, with some level of confidence because um, up to three to 7,000 years ago, that was a lake and the lake has desiccated since um, and the determinus of the Mojave River is really the only fluvial record that we have. So I, I can go back to the, uh, I can go back to the slide. So there was this large delta at the southern end of uh, this is the uh, this is the um, this is the picture that you're thinking of, right, Daryl? Absolutely. Yeah. So some of the it's some of these channels are actually um, active during overspill. It's it's sort of like an anastomosing pattern, right? Mm -hmm. Some of these channels are active during overspill and some of them terminate into splay complexes. There's an there's a example here with where I'm pointing with the lasers and some of them actually collect drainage from splay complexes and then reconnect with the main stem channel as in this example here. That's which, best expressed- Which is an anastomosing. Say what? Which is which an anastomose character. Yeah, yeah. It's I'm I'm using anastomosing here with a little bit of a squishy uh, fit, but um, in, generally speaking, these are systems that follow like they're they're found in uh, in basins that were lacustrine pluvial lacustrine basins that are now desiccated, right? So there is a geomorphological inheritance with the succession of of slope and terraces. And I'm finding this very common that the main stem channel is meandering, but there's a, a number of relic channels on the uh, on the sides that either diverge or converge towards the main stem. Um, the same is the same can be said for the Amargosa River. It's not as obvious from this photo here, but uh, but the, uh, the the general pattern is the same. But I mean. To, go, to, to just answer the question about geomorphological inheritance, sure. I mean, we know that fluvial plant form is not set in time, but what I know is that these rivers are active and they're active with a, with a meandering plant form. So I can only guess that the, the current dynamic stability is that of a, of a meandering river. Yeah, the, the reason I'm asking this question is because the, uh, I think it's the Missouri River that Holbrook looked at. Yeah, it's, it's sort of meandering in braided, uh, sort of straight hybrid river. And I'm just wondering yeah. how much that might be actually quite a good model for some of our Precambrian examples. Mm -hmm. Well, platform style is one of the most, um, you know, debated aspects of geomorphology. And I think that most of it stems from the fact that we we need to uh, we need to reduce natural complexity to a to a set of n members, but that's not how natural systems work <laughs> necessarily. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. All right, we've got a few more questions lined up. Gregory Vitalik and then Sarah Giles. Go ahead, Gregory. Uh, 
Yep, thanks, Alex. Great talk, Sandra. I really enjoyed it. Um, this Amagosa picture looks exactly like uh, a wonderful plot that was created by Andy Button many years ago from the Vit Vortis round. I don't know if you've seen it, but um, what the Vitz is now what two point eight billion years old or something like that. But my 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 question is, you you also get um, meandering on tidal flats, which are completely unvegetated. Um, and tidal flats also show a really remarkable channel morphology where they flare seaward. The width of the channel increases dramatically as you go seaward. Um, and this morphology has been found at a very famous Ediacaran fossil locality in Namibia. Have you um, thought about tidal flats in the Precambrian, especially ones that are well enough exposed to see that, uh, me that meandering and the flaring? So a key, the, the key to your question is mud, right? Right. Um, as a, in, a, in a purely continental river, we have fresh water and, and that will make, uh, unless there's a significant, significant binding by microbial mats, for example, will, will make uh, much of the mud be bypassed. And as we enter a tidal or, you know, it can't, it doesn't have necessarily to be tidal, but as we enter a brackish or fully marine realm, of course, there's fluctuation of mud. And that's why tidal flats are typically uh, pretty sticky. And, uh, and that's what overwhelmingly controls bank cohesion right. in, in that realm, right? Yeah, um, it's, it, it's mud and it's a very low gradient, like your picture here, yes. the Amagos, both things. Yeah. So yeah, the, uh, a, a, course, a course peril can be established in that, as you say, it's a matter of very low stream power characterized specifically by the, the uh, gradient that approximates the zero and, uh, and the abundance of mud. Um, the Amargosa, is also an endorheic sink. So mud cannot escape oceanward. And uh, in, in, in our recollection with Mathieu is really, is really the reason why these meandering rivers that lack vegetation are currently restricted to endorheic sinks. So where, where mud cannot escape and the gradient goes down. So yeah, in a sense, the, uh, the um, a first order peril can be established in the EDI. Thanks. All right, go ahead, uh, Sarah, ask a question. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I was um, actually gonna ask a more general question. So I work on Ediacaran Paleo Canyons in South Australia and in Death Valley. And um, we're working on something as simple as, are these Paleo Canyons submarine channels or are they fluvial? And I was just wondering if, from any of your work, um, have you noticed any geometries or you know new structures you would recommend we look at to, you know, even decipher if these paleo canyons are fluvial to start with in the Precambrian? Uh, so the um, the channels that I have been talking about right now they are exquisitely depositional. So they have a budget of sedimentation that allows them to, to build up over time. And that means that the channel itself is reworking material that is its own floodplain deposit. Okay, so the, uh, this, the bank strength, which in this case is the, the, the strength of, of the deposits is determined by the grain size of the sediment that was transported by the river. When you're looking at canyons, uh, the, it's different in that the bank strength, now it's controlled by the bedrock, right? So in that sense, unless you have uh, paleontological indicators, I think that from a, from a purely, yeah, the, the answer is that I, I, I wouldn't know. I Like oh, using uh, just, mechanical first principles, I would tell you that uh, a canyon is a canyon and the way it erodes uh, subaerially or the way it erodes in a submarine realm will obey to the same laws of physics, right? Uh, 
Um, and that would be the, the safe answer. The, um, if, if you want to explore differences, one could probably say that uh, you know, flow structure and, 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 and stream power is probably fractionated differently subaerially than, than in, in submarine realms. So there could be geometric differences, but it's something that would be answered by an expert on canyons. There's a, there's a very good group at Caltech uh, with, with Mike Lamb. They, they have really good experience in, uh, in canyon formation on, on Earth, on Mars, and they would give you a, a much more informative answer. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I wonder if I can jump in and just tell Sarah that Nicholas Christie Blick is looking again at the Wanaka canyons. And um, I concluded that they were fluvially excavated and he's coming to the same conclusion but sadly, he's been foxed out of fieldwork by, by COVID. So, so I'm Nick Christie Blick's student. Oh, you are? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're totally on the same way. Pallius, I'll say yes. So um, I don't, and, and so do the ice tabs. But there's lots of ways of looking at that problem. It's been fantastic. Well, glad to meet you. And I hope you get there soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, we're going to hop back to the chat for a question real quick, and then Nathan Marshall after that. So, Ava Stoikin asks, does the presence of microbial biomass have any significant effect on sediment binding in rivers? I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you, Alex. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, do, does this sound better? Uh, yeah, if it's in the chat box, I can. Yeah. Okay, from Eva. Yeah. Ava Stoikin. Does the presence of microbial biomass have any significant effects on sediment binding in rivers? Um, it certainly does today. Uh, and by extrapolation, we can think that it certainly did so also in the Precambrian. But to what extent uh, it's something that it's, it's very hard to quantify for me. The, the key is that nowadays microbial mats can thrive, like they, they're present pretty much everywhere in fluvial landscapes, but, but they're also intensively preyed upon, right? All the complex life that crawls through a floodplain now, you know, they love to eat microbial mats. So one could, by extrapolation, think that in a Precambrian world that lacked, um, evolved life, perhaps microbial mats were at the top of the food chain and not at the bottom. So in that sense, perhaps they, there was significantly more biomass, relatively speaking, represented by microbial mats than today. And in that sense, yes, they would have been able to provide significant binding. It's not just about binding, they provide also plasticity to, to sediment. So yes, it, it, they indeed alter the, um, the erodibility of the banks. And something that is not always considered, they incredibly alter the stability field of bed forms, right? So if you, if you go back to the, uh, to the fruit number and if you plot, you know, you know, sediment grain size and, and, uh, and flow velocity, and you look at the stability field of, of uh, bed forms like ripples, dunes, plain beds, anti-dunes, what you get, the results that you get in a lab, they're so far off from the results that you get in a natural river because the natural rivers have microbial uh, filaments binding sediment and the lab typically is barren or, or semi-barren. Right, so definitely, I would expect that the binding of microbial mats in the Precambrian world was uh, uh, significant, but we face a gigantic preservation bias. I think like very hard to constrain from you know the the taphonomic window is is kind of like limited. So um, unless we explore that biogeochemically, like with some, some geochemical signatures. I, I don't know how else we would be able to quantify that. All right, great, thanks. 
Nathan, you have a question to cover? Yeah, uh, great talk. I really loved all the uh, the images. Um, it was a really fun presentation. Um, you showed one slide that had um, kind of the appearance of crypto scores, and then in the kind of mid Devonian showed that there was forest. Um, my question is about um, kind of how important roots are for these early plants when uh, stopping the meandering or like limiting the meandering of these rivers. Um, that like maybe these early land plants didn't have very deep root systems or maybe like in the image behind you, <laughs> you, you there's, they're covered with grass on the top um, which I imagine maybe have some effect. Like, uh, at what point do you think that these systems are like uh, these early plants would have these rooting systems or enough like area of vegetation covering the surface that it would have a like a, a, a larger effect than maybe kind of when early land plants were just starting to get onto the continents? Mm -hmm. That is really a um, spot on question. Like it's, it, it is one of the uh, aspects of uh, Paleozoic, of the Paleozoic fluvial record that is uh, debated right now. So the, the early view of, of uh, Neil Davis and, and Martin Gibling was that yes, the, the main role was, was that of roots. So really mechanical strengthening and that uh, anything else was allied to it but was not the main factor. And uh, um, there's, a, there's a recent study that appeared in, in Science by Sarah Zeichner last year. And uh, they actually make the point that uh, early land plants, as you say, they lacked extensive rooting structures, but they were nonetheless being able to um, organic acids and, and other organic compounds to promote intense flocculation of mud in floodplains. Okay, so this is where it's sort of like the parts. So one one thing is looking at meandering plant forms, and one thing is is looking at the amount of mud rock in um, in uh, in alluvial basins, and and of course they are intimately tied. To one another, and uh, um, I I generally espouse the thesis that the um, that early plants probably had a pretty strong influence on uh, on mud fluctuation just by you know providing an abundance of organic compounds in the water column. Um, I don't know, Will. Will, are you here? Well, McMahon is here in uh, in the audience. I saw him earlier. I wonder if you if you can add a couple of things because you had the uh, you had the the 2018 science paper on 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 mud with Neil. Yeah, uh, my 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 opinion largely is like like you said correctly. A lot of the earlier work focused on the below ground activity of roots. I think if you uh, speak to people who really focus on uh, ecosystem engineering in, in modern day rivers, they'll say what's going on on your point bars and your floodplains is, is far more important. And that above ground uh, trapping effect caused by those uh, above ground structures, which would be novel at the time of plants first colonization, they're gonna sufficiently reduce Hortonian overland flow. That's gonna capture sedimentary particles, force things like mud deposition which is gonna be cohesive, act as a positive feedback loop to trap more muds. So there's definitely an above ground effect, which was kind of neglected in these earlier studies uh, on pre-vegetation stratigraphy, early paleozoic stratigraphy. And then like Ale said, the, uh, the work by Sarah Zeichner and Woody Fisher showing this sort of previously not thought about uh, flocculation effect. And if plants are facilitating greater organic matter production, that's gonna to lead to more flocculation, that's gonna to lead to more mud. And that's going to impact your plan forms, like Ali said. So that's kind of where I stand. Yeah, yeah. I I fully agree. <laughs> All right. So the uh, next question, Philip Fairlick said something in the chat that uh, we'll go to next, and then Daryl has been raising his hand, so that will be next after that. Um, can everybody? You can hear me, all right, Alessandra? Yeah, yeah. Now I can hear. Yeah. 
I just read these out loud for the, uh, for the recording. Um, so Philip Freilich says, good talk with migration rates and order of magnitude faster for non-vegetated floodplains. Bank stability is considerably less. Would that lead to greater storage of the coarser channel facies and less fine less fines left in the fluvial record as the fines would be preferentially pushed through the system? Wouldn't that deliver more nutrients and carbon to the ocean where the carbon could be stored? Um, yeah, and it 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 really depends on. Uh, I think that it really depends on what portion of the fluvial system is captured in your stratigraphy, right? So um, stream power depends on, on discharge, depends on slope and, and, and then density and, and gravity. Uh, assuming that density and gravity, you know, to a first extent, they don't uh, differ much, discharge and slope follow, you know, well-established gradients throughout a watershed. So in, I think that's the key to, to, under, to, to reply to your question. In, in some portions, yes, depending on uh, stream power, we'll have greater storage of coarser materials and, and bypass of finer grain material. But in other portions, especially towards the terminal uh, reaches that are very low gradient, of a, of a fluvial system, we might actually be in a scenario where all that we receive is fine grain material from upstream, right? So that would be a scenario where simply there is no course. Um, and, and also the other consideration is that not all fluvial systems are connected to an ocean. So we, I've, I've presented the, um, I presented the results from, from the modern endorheic basins. And, and a key consideration is that the best analogs to this endorheic basins, I think they are in the Precambrian, they are actually basins that were either found in, in uh, continental and cratonic interlands, so, or, or in relatively confined forelands. So in, in areas where arguably the connection to the sea was either spotty or maybe absent at all. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a broad question. And I think that the answer is, it really depends on what basin reach is captured in your stratigraphy, which inherently depends on, you know, how fragmentary a certain basin record is, not just stratigraphically, you know, in, in the vertical direction, but also laterally. And I, I guess my uh, question is really about um, the carbon storage, because the carbon, of course, doesn't disappear because it's not being stored in upper more active reaches of rivers. It's going to be flushed into something. I said the ocean, because that's where most mm. rivers end up. But of course, it can be lakes, it can be inland basins, what, whatever, but the, the carbon isn't just going to disappear. It will still well, unless it's oxidized. Uh, it, and that's that's the thing. I mean, if we go back before the Great Oxidation event, and even after the Great Oxidation event with low oxygen levels, as Andre uh, mentioned earlier, there's much less chance of it getting oxidized um, because there's not that much oxygen around, especially if it ends up in the ocean and mm -hmm. in the Archean. The Archean is just loaded with car carbonaceous black shales all over the place. And you know, that carbon's coming from someplace. So that's, I guess, uh, the, the point I, I was trying to make based yeah, on I see. your stuff. Yeah, certainly. In, that would, yeah, that would lead to different patterns of ocean board delivery, or, or at least, you know, delivery of a system. Uh, yeah, yeah, it ties back to what Andrew was saying about potentially lower incidence of oxidation because of oxygen levels. Yeah, something definitely plants a seed. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Daryl. Okay, one of, one of the key differences that we, we seem to have recorded so far in pre-vegetation systems is a general paucity of mud. And 
Uh, one of the things that strikes me from your studies of river migration rates is that uh, with, cis, with your meandering systems and probably also with braided systems, if the migration rate is higher and they keep reworking any potential mudplains that the organic content would be constantly reworked and therefore would not be available to break down uh, the felspars, et cetera, to produce clays. Any opinion on that? Um, let me see. So most of the, uh, yeah, most of the, most of the chemical weathering really, like if we, if we look at fluvial systems today, where chemical weathering in the watershed really plays a role. I mean, if we look at the Amazon basin, most of the clays are generated in, in these point bars that, you know, are deposited and then they're left stranded in the hot, humid climate for like 500 years, right? So indeed, um, the, uh, the production of clay in the, in the depositional portion of the basin would be perhaps lower because as you say, migration would be faster and, and the time scale of reworking would be lower. Um, however, the, um, whether that can or not be recorded in the sedimentary record depends on how important the production of clay in the alluvial plain is relative to the production of clay in the watershed, like in the uplands. So we, we were actually talking about this with, with Martin not too long ago. And, and you know, you can split, you can split uh, a watershed in terms of mud factories, right? You can, you can have, you can consider how much mud is produced in the uplands due to, you know, mass wasting and chemical attack on bedrock, how much mud is produced in the alluvial plain due to maturation of sediment and, and whether or not mud is retained or transported downstream. And, and if you look at any sedimentary basin, really the, uh, you know, the, the depositional, in terms of surface area, if you look at any watershed, the area that is frankly depositional and that is frankly characterized by a, a positive aggradation rate is relatively limited or not limited, but I mean, it's subordinate to the surface area of the watershed that is bedrock and, and subject to, you know, upland processes. So in that sense, certainly migration does have an impact on, on maturation of, of, you know, on chemical maturation in the alluvial plain. But I think the real question is how do we quantify its relation or its importance relative to upland processes. Does that make any sense, Daryl? Yeah, maybe Will has a better answer. Or is keeping quiet deliberately? Uh, I'll keep quiet. I don't think I do have a better answer right now, but I'm interested. You don't? F feel free to chime in if you... No, absolutely not. No. <laughs> I talked about the, uh, the, the, the three-partite three -partite mud factory with you as well, Will, I think. So we, we bounced that idea back and forth. Yeah, I think, I think the mud production side of things is unsolved and, and very interesting. I, I know a couple of uh, groups uh, at Macquarie University have really started looking into the mineralogy of um, protozoic mudstone samples that they've, they've uh, collected and found a far sort of stronger or greater detrital component and very few pedogenically produced clays. So actually assessing this, you know, in bulk for hundreds of outcrops or dozens of outcrops through the Paleozoic to see if there's any revealed clear trend in uh, the mud factory, I think that would be really, that would be an interesting thing to do. Yeah. Right now there's and, a lot of samples, but. And the other, the other key consideration and, and this well, as, as you were saying this, it, it came to my mind again. The other key consideration is that in the long term, vegetation or not vegetation, you cannot negate the long term 
balance of the carbon cycle and specifically the, the, the concentration of atmospheric CO2. So if, you, if, if locally you accelerate or decelerate silicate weathering and therefore mud production, you need geologically speaking in the next few million years, something that counterbalances that sink. Otherwise, you know, otherwise Earth becomes either Venus or either Mars, right? You enter a, a runaway sh scenario that of course is not in the rock record, right? Uh, and, and I'm talking about like real runaway, like post snowball Earth to the point where CO2 uh, becomes solid and you cannot recover like a, a Mars scenario. Um, so that, that's the other key consideration. The input of CO2 in the atmosphere is, is volcanic and metamorphic degassing. And in the output, you can, you can tune it whichever way you want it, but eventually it must match the input. So uh, yeah, land plants may have altered locally the incidence of chemical weathering, but at the same time, the, the output, the long-term output, the burial must have matched the, the input. And but that input could have varied over time, right? We're not talking, that input could still vary through time. That input, that input varies over time. I mean, if you think of the decan traps, like you have overshoots of, of uh, CO2, but the, uh, the key is time. And that, again, it's, it's, it's something that over five to 10 million years has to be, has to be rebalanced. Of course, yes, CO2 concentration changed uh, through time with, uh, with both short and long-term, um, you know, variations, but it has to remain, it has to remain within, within this golden window that we have on earth. Otherwise it's, otherwise it's Venus or, or Mars. So there was always enough mud to go around. <laughs> so it, 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 in, my, in my humble opinion, uh, when we're looking at mud, and, and Will, I hope that, that I'm not you know, pissing you off with this. No, 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 it, no, no, in no, my no, humble no. opinion, is what we're seeing is, uh, is a modulation of, of retention, not a modulation of production. Yeah, and, and of course, you know, this is, uh, this is something that now is, it's, is, full, is a full spin-off away from meandering rivers. Yeah. But, but of course, mud provides cohesion, and, and cohesion is key to, to plant form and migration and so forth. So, yeah. That's a very exciting question, that's for sure. Yeah. So I, I uh, am going to take my, um, my power as the host and ask my question. <laughs> um, but uh, so I, just this discussion and from your talks, sort of what appeared to me to be some of the major difference between Precambrian and uh, post uh, post plants um, rivers was sort of the periodicity or this addition of an episodic flux of muds and nutrients with meandering and river cutoff that may not have been present in the past. Um, and sort of coming back around to Philip Fairley's question about, or comment about, you know, there not being any fine grains in Precambrian uh, sediments. I'm, I'm sort of just wondering if this, this periodicity or maybe some sort of episodic, you know, fluxes of nutrients more recently is, is a significant difference than maybe a more regular flux of fine grains and nutrients in the Precambrian, if that's something significant to look into and consider on basin scales, you know, with this periodicity being, what, what could that do to a basin? I mean, if you're flushing in a whole lot of reductant solid at once, you're, you can deoxygenate a basin perhaps in more than it was. If you're, if you're continually bringing reductants in from rivers, you know, not episodically, maybe it's not as much of a, not as significant. And also you don't have as much oxygen to, to begin with in the Precambrian anyway. That's just sort of what I, yeah. Yeah, 
And I, and honestly, like I, I, I'll tell you straight up, like I don't have an intelligent answer to that in, in that it, it's something that at that point straddles more in the realm of, uh, of geochemistry than, than uh, fluid geomorphology. And I think that, I think that looking at the uh, modern basins gives you uh, a set of first principles that then you can perhaps extend into the Precambrian record. And all those questions that, that, that come to mind, including you know, the question that you just asked me, it's something that you know, they're, they're for further tests that can be uh, uh, performed with, uh, with geochemical analysis and that can be integrated with the first principles that we get from, from morphodynamics observations. But in, I, I can't tell you much more than that in that you know, I'm, not by, uh, I'm not by formation a, a geochemist. So I- Right, yeah. I, I, can, I can leave it at that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, definitely. It seems like these are really complicated systems that are like- I have two short comments. Uh, one is, uh, so with advent of plants, uh, like plants uh, require potassium and consume potassium. And so I was always wondering what effect um, uh, appearance of plants could have had on retention of potassium. And uh, so supposedly uh, in Precambrian, potassium was more uh, mobile and we see a lot of potassium metasomatism in Precambrian paleosols. But I'm wondering if anyone kind of looked on it in some quantity or in some way or wrote about it. Do you know anything about it? I wonder, also. I was wondering if Alessandro maybe lost connection. Oh. Alessandro, are you connected? I, yeah, I lost the audio for, for the last 30 oh. seconds. Sorry. Uh, oh. uh, uh, yeah, sorry. I was saying, like, uh, would uh, uh, consumption of potassium by uh, plants uh, on the land, would it have? A much impact, and can we see it in a rock record? Um, or did they, did anyone discuss it, uh, sort of like in terms of fiber geochemistry? I'm not aware of anybody who has looked into that uh, in, in, you know, into any detail okay. of, of that. But it's it's another one of those, you know, spin-offs that can be geochemically tested, I think. And other question and in response to Greg, uh, I was wondering when you bring mud to the tidal flats uh, due to high ionic strength, uh, maybe it's uh, enhanced population of mud in tidal environments. Just Which is, you know, controlled by salinity in part, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's the mention to brackish and saline conditions, yeah. Um, most, of those, most of those intertidal things though, if you actually go on them, they're just absolutely coated by new layers of algae every day. They're, they're just horrible. Yeah. yeah. And, the, uh, and the flow structure is, uh, the flow structure is so different because of course you know, river flows, the river flows downstream, but in the tidal flat you have Reversal. Or reversals, which uh, generate some interesting morphodynamic differences, mm -hmm. especially in terms of plant form. Like they look, they look meandering, but they're very different meanders in terms of geometry. Yeah. Um, Alex, I see there is a question in the chat. Yes. We have yeah. one from the chat, Paul Bielski, and one, then the next one from uh, Francesco Silvestri. Paul Bielski asks, Question to organic material causing 
housing sediment binding, would this assume that there would be lower organic carbon retention in prevegetated fluvial systems? And to follow that up with part of Phil's question, would the lower rate of sediment binding have an effect on the retention of signs with the fluvial systems? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, I think it plays well into the, the whole discussion that we were having with Will. Uh, if, you, if you look at the results th that I present, yes, theoretically there would be, uh, if, the, if the fluvial system is connected to an ocean, theoretically you would have uh, lower retention or if you wish faster, faster bypass of, of organic carbon in, uh, in prevegetation fluvial system, simply because the, uh, the soil residence time scale is, is lower. So you, uh, yeah, you have lower intervals between two successive episodes of transport. And then we don't really know uh, how long the organic carbon would travel downstream between episodes of the, of the position, but there are some, uh, metrics like the advection distance at the advection time scales that could help model that. But I think yes, in, in, in general, the, um, the net effect would be that you would have uh, a faster delivery or if you wish, lower retention in prevegetation fluvial systems. And the lower rate of sediment binding have an effect on the retention. Um, yes, again, with the uh, I guess, again, with the caveat that we don't really know how much uh, microbial life was important in terms of, you know, proper biomass in, in a world where they're not at the bottom of the food chain, but they're at the top. <laughs> All right. Uh, Francesco, your, uh, your hand is up. Hi, Francesco. Uh, ciao Alessandro, nice to meet you. And uh, yeah, not, not a question, not a real question, just uh, I, I was wondering about your opinion about modern unvegetated rivers and the Martian rivers. Could you con can you consider uh, modern unvegetated rivers a good Martian analog or not? Because uh, so far on Mars, you can consider those rivers unvegetated. On Earth, uh, <laughs> but on Earth, uh, you can consider those rivers poorly vegetated, not really unvegetated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what... there's, yeah, there's some key, <clears throat> there's some key consideration. So when I, when I call my rivers unvegetated, first of all, I'm on Earth, I'm, I'm telling you a white lie because really like all these watersheds have some vegetation in in the uplands in the bedrock right so the the we know that the the sediment that we get downstream uh, it's not it's it's not the record of an of, of a fully barren landscape right um <clears throat> so that's one key consideration but if you really focus on the uh morphodynamic of the individual reach in the depositional reach of the basin. Uh, I mean, the, the work that we've done with Mattia, yes, operates essentially on the postulate that the, the behavior, the mechanical behavior of, of a meander on earth is gonna, is gonna be the same of a mechanical behavior of a meander on, on Mars, right? Um, the uh, I've, I've presented in, in you know that little eye candy for you probably in the last slide when I showed how to uh, you know the, the workflow that we um, that we applied with Mathieu to scale migration rates on Earth to migration rate on Mars. Um, there is a there is a relatively simple um, workflow that assumes. Uh, relatively low rates of sediment transport. So, uh, you know, migration rate locally depends on, on the excess of uh, shear on the outer bank with respect to the, the average shear of the flow within the channel and depends on the bank irritability. Uh, it's, it's like the formulation of Howard in, in 1992. 
And that can be used as the key to translate our results to Mars, right? It's something that is, is just based on Newtonian physics, right? Uh, but it's a formulation that works where you have relatively low sedimentation rates. And, you know, in, in a setting where you, you don't have a lot of sudden input of sediment by say, you know, extensive bank failure. And um, it's an assumption that works well on earth because on earth we have the hydrographs of the, of the Amargosa, we have the hydrographs of the, uh, of the Mojave and we know how they behave. But if you, if you know how intermittent Martian rivers were, please let me know because we don't really have a clue, right? Like, and I, I'm saying this half jokingly, I actually like in the paper we, we published with Mathieu on, on advances, like we, we make predictions on, on intermittency, right? So on how often Martian rivers would have reached bankfall. Uh, but, but, you know, those, those are estimates that come with enormous two sigma <laughs> uncertainties, right? And, and uh, rather than to give an answer is to, is more like to, you know, give a prediction that will later be uh, refined once, uh, once we starting to get some good data from, uh, from the rover at Jezero, right? So yeah, I think talking about intermittency on Mars, in my opinion, it doesn't make uh, sense because uh, in my opinion, it's purely speculation. Yeah, because yeah. And, and uh, I mean, I, I think that even in the most conservative, in the most conservative scenarios, you're still looking at, at uh, you know, un unless you believe in an extremely wet and hot Mars, I think that in, in, in the most conservative scenario, you're still looking at like one sol of activity of bankfall every several, several thousand years, right? And I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in Martian geology and you are, so uh, I'm curious to hear actually what you think, but, but the, uh, you know, we, we operated under the assumption that this transport limited condition can apply, but we know that the intermittency of rivers on earth and rivers on Mars are gonna be like severely um, discrepant, right? Yeah, what I, what I did on Jezero uh, basically is just estimate uh, a minimum time scale because in my opinion on Mars, what you can do is estimate minimum time scale. Yeah. Because you don't know evapotranspir evapotranspiration, you don't know intermittency, you don't know percolation, you don't know groundwater contribution. So you don't know any of these uh, parameters. So yeah. this is what I think, uh, then it could be 1 million or uh, 30 million of years, uh, who knows. Yeah, so for, uh, for, the, um, for the rest of the audience, there's, there's, this other, uh, there's this other consideration that rivers do not migrate constantly. Like a river migrates when it attains the so-called formative stage, also known as bankful condition. So when when the water basically fills the channel to its brim, and and most of the geomorphic work, so most of the actual erosion from the outer bank and deposition on the inner bank takes place at bankful. So in a river that is, uh, you know, that experiences a flood once every. 50 or maybe 50,000 years <laughs> comparing migration to a river that experiences migration once a year is, is flawed, right? And in, in the study that we published with Mathieu in like the, the migration analysis, we make the case that at least on earth, arid rivers and, and humid climate rivers have similar intermittency to a first order. But in, in this, conversation with Francesco, like ex extrapolating this to Mars becomes really um, uh, squishy. And uh, I think that, you know, a, a, key to, a key to understand intermittency 
as Francesco was saying, is just, you know, have a, have a first order volume estimate in this case of this delta at Jezero, and then use geochronological constraints to understand how long that delta took to form. And, and, and then you have a volumetric over time equation and, and you go from there. But um, Francesco, I understand that also just, to, just the geochronological tie points to understand when the Jezero delta was active, they are in itself pretty uh, <laughs> preliminary, right? And what do you think about, uh, because you talk about uh, vegetation in the watershed or, uh, but what about vegetation or I don't know, micro vegetation in meander? Like, you know, if you, if you take uh, rivers in Sahara, mm -hmm. for example, in some region uh, during the summer, they seem uh, unvegetated. But uh, during the wet season, they look like uh, yeah, they <clears throat> they have flowering. They have flowering. Yeah. Um, so one one thing that you can do is first of all to establish some some thresholds, right? What is what is partly vegetated and what is unvegetated, and to do that, we resolve to. Um, to, to, to results of, flame ex, of flume, flume experiments. So in, in our recollection, we call it a river unvegetated when we have say less than 5% of vegetation density in the floodplain. And when the ratio between the largest plant stem and the channel is 10 to minus three or 10 to minus four or less, just because we know from flume experiments that below those thresholds, plants do not significantly seem to alter plant form. Um, and then there's the, and then there's the uh, consideration that you have about, you know, areas that are unvegetated when dry, and then, and then they have flowering seasons, right? And Death Valley is an example. Death Valley is not completely unvegetated all the time. But the point is that <clears throat> when you have a flood, uh, so typically what, what happens in Death Valley is that in, in, uh, in the watershed, in the Pahuri Mesa, you have a, 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 a low that is stalling, you know, a storm cell that is stalling, is concentrating precipitation there. Because there is very little vegetation or no vegetation at all in the watershed, the flood wave is, is transmitted down the watershed in a matter of like six to 12 hours. Like it's extremely fast, such that the river attains bankful conditions when it is unvegetated. And then three, four days later, when the river is already like way below uh, flood stage or perhaps already almost dry, that's when the flowering happens. So <laughs> we're, we're getting really nitpicky here, but the, the point is that the morphodynamic behavior records on vegetated conditions. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, okay. that's, 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 that's an important consideration, right? Because uh, you, you have to ask yourself in time and space how things change with, uh, with biological communities, of course. I don't think it's necessarily just biological communities. I think one of the things that we have to look at at Mars and hopefully this will happen soon, is bank stability. Like how reactive is, is uh, say, basaltic dust to uh, sal saline or hypersaline solutions? Has anybody worked on that at all? In Iceland, yeah. There's, uh, a, I'm not part of that research group, but uh, I know that Caltech and, and, and other groups are doing analog modeling in uh, unvegetated basaltic surfaces, um, not basaltic, but I mean, unvegetated sedimentary surfaces that are entirely derived from basalt in Iceland. And they're doing some, uh, some experiments that are more exquisitely in the realm of mineralogy than, yeah. uh, than fluvial. So again, something that I cannot fully speak about because I lack the expertise, but I know that, I know that they're looking at that and there's even Mars Hill in uh, in Death Valley. It's a, it's a little knob of basalt 
It's about 10, 15 kilometers south of, uh, of uh, Bad Water, uh, sorry, of, uh, of um, Furnace Creek. And that's actually where some of the early Mars rovers were, were tested. And later on, it was also the site for some geochemical studies. Because in, in that valley, you have, you have the temperature that it's kind of high with respect to Mars, but at the same time, you have spots where you have the basaltic conditions and you have uh, you know, potentially hypersaline conditions. Because of course, it's, uh, it's an indirect depocenter. All right, great. Well, I think it's time to thank you, Alessandra, for a great talk and um, this generated a great discussion. Yeah, thank, um, thanks everyone for you. the questions. Yeah, we've had you on the hot plate for a oh, while. I love now. It. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, uh, until next week, and everybody take care um, and see you then. All right.